Now, from CBS 4 News, this is Facing South Florida with Jim DeFeedy. Good morning, I'm Jim DeFeedy and welcome to Facing South Florida. In just five weeks, the Florida legislature will begin its 60 day session. The January 9 start date comes a little early this year and there is a lot to deal with. There is the effect Hurricane Irma will have on the state budget. There is nursing home reform following the deaths of more than a dozen residents from the Hollywood Hills nursing home. There are proposals to revamp colleges and universities and all of this set against a backdrop of sexual harassment allegations and reports of spying that have rocked Tallahassee. So as I said, it's a busy time. Joining me to preview the session is the Speaker of the Florida House of Representatives, Richard Corcoran, a Republican from Lando Lakes, which is just north of Tampa. Mr. Speaker, thank you for coming in again. Thanks for having me, Jim. You know, this is, it's always a good time to get you in just before the session starts. We can talk about the optimism of what the session provides. But before we get to the optimism, let's deal with a little bit of the news of the day. Uh, har sexual harassment has been an issue that we're seeing all over the country, certainly in Tallahassee as well. As you know, the one of the state senators had to resign following allegations of, of a wrong sexual affair. The Senate, uh, the chairman of the Florida Democratic Party stepped down over sexual harassment claims. And the, and the senator in charge of the budget appropriations, Jack Latvala, also has been hit with these. What's going on in Tallahassee? Well, I think it's you've seen it nationwide, not just in Tallahassee. We're seeing it in the, the Hollywood. We're seeing it in Washington, D.C. We're seeing it in the newscasters. Today, another individual was fired because of sexual harassment. I think it's a pervasive thing, and, and that's why we took the lead. If you remember, Jimmy, you go back just nine months ago, before any of this broke, uh, and we took over the legislature, uh, we instituted the toughest arguable sexual harassment policies and, and rules and regulations in our House rules to deal with this. In addition to that, we had mandatory training for every single member so that they were without excuse for what is and what is not sexual harassment. And it's done a, a yeoman's job in going in for the House of Representatives in Florida in cleaning up that behavior and, and, and creating a, 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 an environment where people can go and thrive and work and, and, and enjoy, their, uh, enjoy their productivity. Um, I think so you, so you, you feel confident that there is no sexual harassment going on in the Florida House? No, I feel confident that what we did by instituting the toughest rules, the toughest laws that we've had forever, the toughest training in the House of Representatives is dramatically move that needle to creating that environment where that, that hopefully won't take place. You can't govern. You can't govern against human nature. People are going to always do bad things. That's the history of mankind. I just want to get... But you can certainly keep an environment where people are safe. On the House side, because I know this has been an issue on the Senate side. On the House side, if someone feels they're the victim of sexual harassment, who do they report to in the House? There's a variety. I mean, they can go. We have an HR, um, so they can go straight to HR. It's an attorney um, uh, who is. Does he, that attorney work for you, though, as Speaker? Uh, under the auspices of the of the legislature, that's correct. Should it should it be someone independent? Because I know the Senate is grappling with this. Well, we, we also we we could use um, Office of Legislative Information Services, um, but we, all of those we they, we could, they can go to their. their their party representative, they can go to their um, chairman, they can go to pro tem, they can go to the um, uh, our human resource person, they can go to our general counsel, any of those situations. And, and, and honestly, Jim, we have situations where those bubble up and, and we, and or an allegation, we deal with it very quickly, very swiftly and investigate it and, and, and the absolute de facto position of the House of Representatives is that the person who's making that allegation is going to give get 100% deference and, and cover and comfort through that process because we have zero tolerance for it in the House. Are, is, to your knowledge, has the House paid any settlements to settle sexual harassment claims? No, in fact, the article just came out, I think, in the, I mean, not, not since my involvement in the legislature. I think there was an article about 30 some years ago. Uh, there was a joint legislative staffer that got a settlement. I want to just turn to Jack Latvala, the state senator who is facing a number of accusations. Uh, you've called for him to resign. Why do you believe he should resign when he's still protesting his innocence. Well, I, I think it's a. I don't think he is. I think that there has been an admission. There's been an admission that he um, kissed a, a, a lobbyist. There's been an admission that he was involved in. Uh, but that was a consensual kiss. That wasn't against her will. No. Well, I don't think. I think that whether it's Harvey Weinstein or anybody else, there's a disparity in power. Then, then it. Then that leads to a question of. 
um, is it or is it not sexual harassment that should be investigated. The, um, there has been an admission of being involved with another colleague who has committed sexual misconduct, resigned over that sexual misconduct, and not fully reporting or divulging that sexual misconduct. I think that's an issue for the, the Rules Committee to look at. And now, today, um, through all of the activities that have been taking place, one of the victims has come out publicly and, and, and the reports are grotesque. Just and, and, and I just want to make it clear, too, Jim, think about this. You can be Harvey Weinstein. You can be stripped of your company, stripped of your input, all your awards gone. You can be um, a, uh, a, uh, a TV announcer or whatever, stripped of everything taken away. Um, why, why do we wait so slowly when it comes to political figures? You know, you have John Conyers in, in Washington, D.C. These, th these are folks that should, there should be greater pressure put upon those people when there is that disparity of power. Should the president resign? President of? The United States. Oh, what the, you're, you're talking about two different things. Uh, again, the significant factor, whether whether it's more, whether it's uh, Senator Lat Valla, are admissions, admissions of behavior. There's never been an admission by the president, and there's not been a, a sexual misconduct filing that, that I'm aware of that, that, that has him saying, yeah, I, I, I engaged in that behavior. I, just, I, I don't want to dwell on this much longer, but I just wanted to, the, the, we're taping this on Wednesday, just so everyone's clear. And on Wednesday, Political Florida identified the woman, she came forward, who has filed the complaint against Jack in the Senate. There's been talk that this woman may be politically motivated because her husband is a well-known campaign consultant and Republican operative. You are a potential candidate for governor. You've, said, you've not ruled it out. You said you're going to decide after the session. Do you know Brian Hughes, who is the woman's husband? Do you have any relationship with her, the, you know, the woman involved in this case? What is your role, if any, in this? The answer is none, but, but, I, but I want to address that point. Let's just assume the answer is zero, none. Never hired them, never participated with them, never worked with them on any level, past, present, or future. None. But, but the, the question and, and that argument is so offensive, Jim. It's so offensive. So you're telling me, had that been true, had I had a relationship with Brian Hughes, a relationship with his, with his wife, somehow, some way, in a, in a work capacity, you're telling me that because of that relationship, it disqualifies a woman from being sexually harassed and groped. That's just offensive. I don't care if it was my sister, my mother, my campaign manager, nobody. Nobody should be subject to sexual harassment and disqualified because of relationships. It's offensive at the highest level. All right, let's move on to some other issues. The impact of Hurricane Irma on the state budget. The only thing the state has to do every year is pass a budget. What is the effect that Hurricane Irma is going to have on the state budget this year? Well, I mean, the, the, the hurricane effects normally can trickle in over, uh, you know, six months, a year, two years, three years, those, those impacts. Um, it, but it's going to have an effect. And the effect really at this point for us in the next legislative session is we've uh, convened a select committee. We went out and got in front of it and looked at all those things that were problematic. We looked at our housing um, uh, for uh, hurricane shelters, looked at the traffic coming in and out of the state, looked at our gas reserves and the problem of the lines of the gases, looked at the quantity of outages that we had as, as a result of maybe uh, not having enough underground utilities. So we have, and, the, and then obviously the most egregious thing is the nursing home desk. And we'll get to the nursing home, but I'm talking about the effect on the budget itself. Do you see shortfalls yeah, that, well, are gonna, we, that are going to roll across cuts to the state budget. I just, I just, today I was reading it was another $200 million for the month of October as a result of the effects of Hurricane Irma. So yeah, we're going to see significant effects on the budget. It's going to be a tight budget year. Um, but the more important thing is, I think, from Hurricane Irma, uh, uh, the first time it's hit basically 67 counties, is going out there and fixing those things now that we saw those things that didn't work and making our place a better place for our citizens and a safer place. We lead the nation in dealing with uh, disaster, obviously, because we have so many of them. And I think we did a yeoman's job, but there's always places that we can improve, and I think we're going to. I know this is an issue for the Public Service Commission to approve rate hikes. Florida Power and Light has suggested that they're going to seek $1.3 billion, the cost of repairs and damage to their system. Uh, should they be required to justify that expense before they receive approval for it? For instance, with Hurricane Matthew, they received a rate increase, but even with Hurricane Matthew, and they've already received almost all the money, they still haven't justified the amount that they requested. Do you support FBL's decision to seek that money and should they have to justify it? No, absolutely. There should always be transfer. But should they justify it before they get the increase? Yeah, well, I think that I, I, 
if you go through that process, uh, I don't know what, what you mean by justify before the increase. They have to go before the PSC. They have to go and say, here's all the losses that we had. Here's why we had those losses. And the PSC members vote to, to look at those justifications and decide whether or not they're going to give them a rate increase. All right. You talked about nursing homes. We'll, we'll say that for, for a second. But one thing that I wanted to just sort of follow up on. Actually, let's take a break here. I mean, let's do this. It's a cleaner to take a break here than to start another topic with just a minute or so to go. We'll be right back after the break with House Speaker Richard Corcoran. Thank you.